South Carolina's men's basketball team took the court for the first time heading into this upcoming season for a scrimmage in front of the hometown fans. What did G.G. Jackson show on the court, and who were some of the surprises from Wednesday night? I'll discuss all that and more today on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code Locked On and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and thank you once again for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen every day. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts daily. All right, so we got a couple of different things that we're going to discuss on today's Friday edition of Locked On Gamecocks. I'm going to talk about why the home crowd environment has reached levels at williams Bryce that have not been seen in several years and how this is impacting South Carolina's home football games. And I'm also going to recap what all took place on Wednesday night. As for the first time ever, Gamecock fans got a taste of what they could be seeing this upcoming basketball season with the Mont Paris' inaugural Gamecock men's basketball team. I was able to go to the scrimmage in person and watch all these guys play on the hardwood for about a 20-minute intra-squad scrimmage, and I had a bunch of takeaways from Wednesday night, and to kick things off with this conversation, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room in G.G. Jackson. Obviously, one of the most highly touted men's basketball players to ever come to South Carolina. There was, of course, a lot of hype with this kid, and for good reason. There's a ton of people who think he could be a lottery pick in the 2023 NBA draft. He left high school a whole year early because it seems like that he thinks he is ready for the challenge of college basketball. So, from what I saw at the scrimmage, as you could have probably guessed coming into this thing, Gigi Jackson was wanting to put on a show for the hometown faithful. Obviously, he had some family and friends who were in attendance in the game. They were sitting in one of the front rows in one of the sections that was filled up with fans at Colonial Life. And I think that, of course, that kind of played on him a little bit in the sense that he felt like that he needed to go out there and really try to make some buckets. Now, it wasn't like every time he got the ball, he was immediately trying to go up for a shot. But Gigi Jackson definitely took a decent volume of shots, both from behind the arc and around the baseline and near the paint. And he made a couple of nifty shots, and he showcased that basically he's pretty confident in his abilities. He is not afraid to go out there and to try to make things happen. And again, he didn't make too many shots, but he did have a couple of thunderous dunks in the paint on Wednesday night, which of course did get the crowd on their feet. So... He could shoot the ball from about anywhere on the floor, and I don't think that if you attended the scrimmage, you should read too much into the fact that he did not make a whole lot of shots. Again, his first time ever playing in front of Gamecock fans, even though it was in an unofficial capacity in a scrimmage, he was really wanting to try and, you know, again, probably, you know, put some points up on the board and try to get the crowd all excited and everything. Sort of play to the crowd in a way through that. And of course, there's a lot of things to like about G.G. Jackson's game overall. Now, admittedly, there are a couple of things that I do think he is going to have to work on. First of all, I do want to remind all of you, as exciting as it is to have a player like Gigi Jackson come to your program, especially in the circumstances of having a first-year head coach just starting his career here at South Carolina, there's going to be a, a curve in terms of how he's able to handle the physicality of college basketball. you got to remember, Gigi Jackson is currently 17 years old, and you're going to probably hear this a lot on TV this year if you watch South Carolina's games, but, you know, some people are going to be saying, you know, he should be going to homecoming pretty soon. He should be having high school prom happening in just a couple weeks. All that stuff, you know, the same kind of stuff that these announcers regurgitated over and over again when Jake Bentley went to South Carolina a year early back in 2016 for the football team. So the thing is, 
He brings six feet nine inches of length in terms of his height and has a really solid wingspan. So he can cover a lot of space just purely based off that. But Gigi Jackson does not carry a whole lot of weight. I don't want to say he's just completely skin and bones, but he's going to have to pack on a little bit of muscle in the earlier part of the season. Of course, the tough thing is, when it comes to being in season for these athletes, you don't want to push them so hard that you risk them potentially suffering an injury in workouts. So it's obviously going to have to be carefully calculated out and sort of strategized around in terms of how you're going to go about that. But thankfully, in terms of college basketball, you get a lot of time to really sort of get a guy acclimated to the sport before, you know, the tougher stretch hits, which in this case, of course, is conference play with the SEC games. And that normally starts, I think, around late December, early January. So Gigi Jackson's going to have a solid two months between November and December in order to, again, get acclimated to college basketball, play against collegiate athletes night in and night out, not a bunch of high school kids in the Columbia area. And he's going to have some time to, again, add some good weight to his frame. And the thing is, because of the fact he doesn't have a whole lot of weight on him right now, admittedly, if South Carolina does play a non-conference team during this season, and, you know, I'll use Clemson as an example, and I know y'all are going to like this, but, you know, it is the truth. Clemson's got a really good player on their team in P.J. Hall, who I believe for the most part plays pretty much that four or five spot. Let's imagine that when South Carolina plays Clemson, P.J. Hall and Gigi Jackson go one-on-one -on -one against each other. Now, obviously, in terms of age and experience, that won't be a fair matchup. P.J. Hall's going into his third year playing college basketball, is obviously turning 21 this year, while Gigi Jackson is just turning 18 and is playing in his first ever few games as a college basketball player. But P.J. Hall's going to have a little bit of a size advantage on him in terms of the muscle that he has as a part of his frame. So in terms of him playing man defense, playing in the post, trying to rebound, I think G.G. Jackson, at least at the beginning of the year, he's going to struggle with that. And he's going to have to work really hard to have all the fundamentals down, which again, is easier said than done for a kid that's just starting out in college basketball. He's going to probably get over these hurdles quicker than most freshmen usually would. But I do think that he is going to take some lumps, especially on defense and in particular when it comes to trying to grab boards against guys who are going to have a little bit of a size advantage against him. So overall, well, Gigi Jackson did pretty much what I thought he would do at Garnet and Black Madness. He still put on a show for the fans with the few plays that he did make, including some really sweet dunks in the dunk contest, which he did end up winning later on after the scrimmage officially concluded. But again, it's going to take him some time. So if he doesn't just explode the first few games, you should not be getting all over this kid. Again, he is going to be a good player, but he's going to have to get acclimated for the first few weeks, couple months of the season. So those are my thoughts on G.G. Jackson from Garden Black Madness. Now, in just a few moments, I'll touch on some of the other players who played on Wednesday night in the scrimmage. I'll touch on why Michi Johnson could be an important player in terms of the leadership he might bring to the floor. I'll talk about why Javon Benson might be a big-time surprise contributor for the team this upcoming season. And I'll talk about another freshman who really impressed on Wednesday night and could fight for some minutes in the rotation this season. But before I get into all of that, Today's show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to spice up your college football season. Now, with all the games that Underdog Fantasy has available for this week, I've got two games in particular that I'm going to be looking at. Notre Dame at number 16, Syracuse. Yes, you heard that right. Syracuse is ranked and not Notre Dame. And number 19, Kentucky playing at number 3, Tennessee. Now, for the game between the Irish and the Orange, I'm going to take Notre Dame quarterback Drew Pine to throw for lower than 200 and a half passing yards because he's only passed this mark three times all season long. And he's done this against defenses that ranked 95th or worse in scoring defense on all three occasions. Syracuse's defense, if you're wondering, ranks seventh in scoring 
defense. So yeah, I think that that's a pretty easy bet to take right there. I'm also going to take Tennessee quarterback Hendon Hooker because why not? I mean, the guy might be a Heisman front runner right now to throw for higher than 284 and a half passing yards against Kentucky as he has surpassed that mark in four of the Volunteers' seven games this season. And three of those games happened in the friendly confines of Neyland Stadium. So who would you pick in these scenarios? Sign up with the promo code Locked On in one word, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100, which means if you deposit $100, they'll give you $100 for free. So go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play Store. Once again, that's Underdog Fantasy with the promo code Locked On, all in one word, Get in on the college football pick 'em action today. Welcome back to this Friday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Continuing the discussion on Garnet and Black Madness from Wednesday night. There was a few more observations that I had beyond just G.G. Jackson, starting off with the front court. And again, talking about the guys not named G.G. Jackson, let's talk about the newcomers who are bringing the beef to this men's basketball team. Benjamin Bosman's Verdonk and Daniel Hankins Sanford. Again, hopefully I'm pronouncing Benjamin's name correctly. But both of these guys are built physically, especially Verdong. It was one of the first things that I picked up on during warmups. Verdong is absolutely just a massive human being in his upper body. I mean, this is a guy like, if you've ever seen SpongeBob SquarePants and you remember the episode where SpongeBob tries to get into, you know, that wrestling, those wrestling matches and the guy comes up to him and says, you need to have muscles on your muscles. Well, Benjamin Bosman's Verdong definitely has that. He carries 255 pounds to his six foot eight frame, according to his player profile. And Daniel Hankins Sanford, for a true freshman, is also pretty lean in his own right. He's listed at 233 pounds, but you know he doesn't have a whole lot of sort of baby fat, as people like to call it, that he's got to burn off in his first year. No, he's already in pretty good shape to go ahead and start playing in some of these games early on in the season. Another thing that I picked up on with the front court is the potential deep offensive arsenal that some of these guys have now. Javon Benson and Daniel Hankins Sanford, for different reasons, impressed me a lot on Wednesday night. To start off with Benson, who is now, I think, a second or third year player in this program from Ridgeview High School in his own right, so he's a local kid. Benson has always been pretty much a bench warmer on this team. He never really got a whole lot of playing time unless basically injuries or, you know, a couple of games with COVID the last two years dictated that he had to get into the ball game. And, you know, I don't want to say, of course, that Frank Martin hurt his development in any way, but... You know, as y'all remember from the Frank Martin tenure, Frank did not put up with mistakes happening in basketball games very much. And I think that Javon Benson was admittedly one of those guys where, you know, it's not like he was mistake prone every time he touched the basketball. But I think that he might be a guy that it really seemed to kind of affect him and mess with his psyche in the sense of, well, gee whiz, if I take a bad shot, at least in coach's eyes, and I miss it, I'm coming out of the game. And I think that that really hurt him a great deal, honestly. Because watching him from Wednesday night, you would never think that that was the case from the last couple years. Because Javon Benson was putting the basketball up multiple times, especially from behind the three-point line. And he made a bunch of shots. I mean, he actually had a real solid stroke from deep. And that was a bit of a surprise because, you know, from the last couple years that I can recall, Javon Benson's never really been a three-point shooter from that power forward spot, but he has added that shot now to his offensive arsenal. And he even had a moment where he took the ball from the top of the key, drove past the defender that ran up to him, and then almost posterized Benjamin Bosman's for Donk right at the rack. He did not complete the poster, but he was able to draw a foul and hit two free throws. So to put it bluntly, Benson played with a ton of confidence on Wednesday night, and he made a lot of really impressive shots. So Javon Benson might be a guy that contributes a lot 
more than a lot of people maybe would have thought coming into this season. Daniel Hankins Sanford, another guy that impressed me because, again, he's a true freshman just like G.G. Jackson and Zachary Davis, the point guard that the Gamecocks got from the upstate in South Carolina. He hit a couple of different shots in this game that were eyebrow raisers to me. He had a nice little fadeaway shot and even a step-back shot that he showcased and hit on both occasions in this scrimmage and he also did take a couple of shots from three and he did hit one or two of them now he's not going to probably shoot the three ball kind of like Javon Benson might or maybe even G.G. Jackson but he can hit a shot from deep if he's got the space if he's got the time to really get his feet set and sort of wind up his shot from that area so Daniel Hankin, Sanford, and Javon Benson I walked away from this scrimmage saying these two guys are going to get minutes. I don't know how many minutes these guys are going to get because there's only so many minutes to go around with this group of players. Because again, Benjamin Bosman's Verdant brings a lot of big time experience from his time at Illinois. Gigi Jackson, I mean, obviously, he's going to start in your starting lineup with what he brings to the table. Josh Gray is going to handle that five spot. So getting into all of that, it leads into the question of, What's the rotation going to look like with all these guys and how well some of these guys played from Wednesday night? Well, I do project Josh Gray and Gigi Jackson, as I mentioned a moment ago, are going to start in the front court. And behind them, things do get a little bit murky. You've also got Travon Minot, who brings experience and size to this roster. He's been on, he's one of the original guys who was on this team last year that is actually still on the team this year, one of only five players. But the issue with Travon has always been if he's facing a big man that brings a lot of athleticism to the floor, not to try to sound mean or anything, it's just he's going to be outmatched if he plays somebody that's got a little bit of speed to him at that five spot. He did show a really improved fadeaway shot from the post from Wednesday night scrimmage, which was good to see because Trevon, at least from what, again, what I can recall, has never been really a guy that could, you know, be a threat in the post against opposing defenders. But now he's got a couple shots, again, in his toolbox that he can utilize now. So that's a good sign in terms of his development. But Benjamin Bosman's for Donk, Javon Benson, Daniel Haken, Sanford, all being forced by trade. I think creates a very interesting situation here. And here's what I think could end up happening. I could see where Lamont Paris decides to go a little bit of small ball with this backup group. I could see him maybe playing Verdonk as a slightly undersized five, which I think that Benjamin could definitely do because, again, he's got a lot of strength that he's going to bring to that spot. And when I say undersized, in terms of height for college basketball, he's not undersized by like a country mile. He's six foot eight, which is still, you know, probably at the very lowest end of the totem pole that you can have height wise as a power six center. But I think that he can play that spot. He's got decent enough ball handling ability to be able to, you know, take it from the top of the key. He can drive to the rim. Now, he is a little bit hesitant in terms of driving to the rim and trying to put up a shot, but he's also going to look for an open teammate, and especially teammates who are cutting to the basket, which is where I could see South Carolina getting a lot of their second chance points this season. Now, he plays the five. In my opinion, Javon Benson, Daniel Hank, and Sanford, they could both share minutes at that power forward spot. Lamont Paris could turn into a little mini competition during the season. You know, play them both in non-conference play, give them about equal minutes each night, and pretty much see who ends up winning out that battle. And then get a little bit into conference play, and around that time, Decide which guy you're going to roll with more often when, you know, the backup rotational players have to come into the game. I could totally see that scenario playing out that way with the front court. Now, in terms of three-point snipers, because obviously everybody in basketball these days is all about the three-point shot. So, of course, everyone wants to know who are the players that we could expect to be taking most of those shots this year. And that answer is going to be pretty simple. Michi Johnson and Chico Carter Jr. You've got some other guys on this roster who can hit a three-point shot. But in terms of volume and actually being able to hit multiple threes consecutively, these two guys are your best three-point shooters by far. Chico Carter Jr., I mean, he can hit shot after shot after shot. He could be that guy that gets hot during a game from behind the arc. And then Michi Johnson, the thing with him is he can hit about 25, 30-foot shots from the three-point line. So he's got unlimited range when he's got a shot. So... 
These two guys at the guard spot, they're probably going to be those three-point shooters for the most part. You might see Gigi Jackson take some threes during the year. You might see Hayden Brown take some three-point shots during the year. And a few other guys as well, even Javon Benson. But these two guards right here, Michi Johnson and Chico Carter Jr., those are the guys where if they put up a three, more than likely they're going to be walking down to the other end of the court because they made the shot. Some other miscellaneous notes before we move on here. The guys definitely seem to be more loose heading into this season in terms of not being afraid to take shots. And again, I alluded to this earlier, but when Frank Martin was the head coach here, anyone who follows this team closely enough knows this. He was a stickler in terms of bad decisions during games. He really and truthfully did not give a long enough leash to most of his players if they took a bad shot, if they had a bad turnover. And obviously, you know, there's a place to, you know, get on guys when they make mistakes. There's a place for that when you're a coach. But when you're doing it consistently, when you're doing it all the time, when at least during the game, you don't, you know, give those little fist bumps to the guys like, hey, that was a good defensive possession right there. When you don't do little things like that, it adds up and it weighs down on your players' minds. And, you know, it's going to affect how they play because they're going to play more tight, which for a lot of guys will cause them to make more mistakes during the game. So Lamont Paris has said during this offseason, look, on offense, I'm not going to be someone that's going to get, you know, extremely upset based on what a guy decides to do with the basketball, you know, because he looks at it like this. I'm going to do all the tweaking and such in practice. During a game, it's the player's time to go execute, and I'm just there to try to sort of guide them along in terms of strategy throughout the course of the game. That's pretty much what Lamont Paris has said all offseason. He fulfilled that on Wednesday night. You know, he did call a couple players over after some possessions, especially if there was a foul, to talk to him for a couple seconds and just say, hey, look, you know, you did this, and I understand what your thought process was, but next time maybe think about doing this instead. It'll help you get a better shot selection. You know, stuff like that. I noticed that during the scrimmage, and I think that it's going to help this team such a great deal. Last point, Michi Johnson, he was a vocal leader on Wednesday night. And yes, Hayden Brown was not out there, and that was probably part of the reason why he was being vocal. But Michi was talking to the guys a lot, almost every single possession. And I've been, I was very impressed with him in terms of the fact that he is a transfer guard. You know, he hasn't played any games with this team on this roster, and yet he's come in here, you know, and again, not in a bad way, but sort of like, you know, look, I'm going to be one of those alphas. I'm going to try to help these guys along throughout the course of a game, you know, give them my constructive feedback on what I think they should do if maybe a play goes down a certain way. And I think that that's great. He and Hayden Brown, it seems like, are going to share the load in terms of leadership responsibilities this upcoming season. So the Gamecocks... Definitely seems like already got a couple of leaders that are showcasing themselves on the hardwood before this season even starts. Now, while the men's basketball team is getting ready to start their season in the Colonial Life Arena, South Carolina is getting near the final stretch of the regular season for their team as they're going to be playing the Missouri Tigers on Saturday afternoon in williams Bryce Stadium, which has become a real tough environment for opposing teams to play in once again, how has this happened? I'm going to explain all of that and more in just a couple moments after word from a couple of sponsors. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. All right. So the South Carolina Gamecocks, of course, got a really big game that is happening at Williams-Rice Stadium tomorrow afternoon as they'll be taking on the Missouri Tigers, obviously trying to end a three-game losing streak to the Missouri Tigers, continue the current winning streak that they're on right now and extend that to five games. And if you want to know what I think is going to happen in tomorrow's game, I highly recommend that you go check out the Thursday crossover show that I did with Locked On Mizzou host John Miller. We had a really fun back and forth talking about some of the big storylines and key matchups in this contest and how we think things are going to play out. Needless to say, we both think it's going to be a slobber knocker of a football game, a big time defensive battle. But I want to talk about Williams Bryce Stadium real quick and the atmosphere that the fan base has shown this year because you know something 
If you're season ticket holders, or if you are a fan that's been to any home game for that matter this season, you ought to pat yourselves on the back because I have to be honest, I grew up a South Carolina fan. You know, I went to school at South Carolina. So I've been following South Carolina athletics for a very long time. I was a fan, of course, during the years when this man, Steve Spurrier, for those of you who are listening on audio podcast, was the head coach and Watched all those runs that they went on from 2010 through 2013. Winning the SEC Eastern Division title. Winning 11 games three years in a row. Defeating Clemson five years in a row. Three of those games being in williams Bryce. I saw all this happen. And I have to say, it's been a long time since I have seen the fan base this energized, this engaged, and bring the passion like they have to williams Bryce Stadium this year. I mean... For gosh sakes, the Missouri game coming up, it's the sixth home game already this year, which is just insane to think about. There's only one more home game after this one. Five of the six games, including the Missouri game, have been sold out. Now, admittedly, williams Bryce Stadium does not hold around 80,000 fans like it used to. There's been some modifications made to the stadium in recent years to cater to people basically that are a part of certain clubs, maybe that want to have certain premium seating and stuff like that. So they've taken out some of the seats to where I believe now the official capacity is somewhere like around 77,000, maybe 77,750 people. But the point is... South Carolina's fan base has shown up and shown out in pretty much all of these games this season. And if it wasn't for Hurricane Ian, the unfortunate circumstances surrounding all those events down in Florida, do we get the South Carolina State game? Who knows? Maybe they would be six for six. But, you know, there was a time period just a few years ago at the end of the Steve Spurrier era. Let's be honest. You know, there was probably a lot of fans of South Carolina's fan base that by 2014, they had gotten pretty complacent. And what I mean by that is they weren't going to games and, you know, being so worried, you know, worried about the fact South Carolina could lose the game because South Carolina opposing fans might laugh at this if you're watching or listening to today's show, but it's the truth. South Carolina was winning the majority of their games. They were beating teams that are looked at as historical programs like Georgia and Florida and Tennessee. They were beating all of these teams and Clemson before Clemson became Clemson that everyone knows now. So, you know, the stadium was being packed and the 2012 Georgia game is probably the best example of the best environment that this stadium brings to every given Saturday, when this team especially is doing good. This fan base is already loyal, as some people would say, to a fault at times, but they are loyal. Bleed, guard, and black. And when this team gives them a product that they can cheer on, people are now starting to realize it again. South Carolina fans bring it. They bring it every single weekend during the college football season. The Texas A&M game, the amount of comments and messages, and I mentioned this earlier in the week, the amount of people that have told me that was the loudest game that I've been to since X date, since that Georgia game in 2012, since the last time I went to a home game in 2015, all of that. It's because of what Shane Buehler in this program is doing right now. They're putting a product out there that these fans can cheer for. These fans, they want their team to win, and every fan base wants their team to win. A few fan bases have gone through what South Carolina's fan base has gone through. Few fan bases, in my eyes, are as passionate as South Carolina fans are. That was really shown during the Steve Spurrier era. Then, of course, things fell off at the end, and fans, again, had gotten complacent because of all the winning that had happened. So I think what happened was you saw sort of one generation of fans sort of partly exit when all of that fell apart. Then the Will Muschamp era came, and quite frankly, the environment just never seemed the same when Will Muschamp was the head coach there. And I do think, of course, part of it's the fact, obviously, he did not win at the level that Steve Spurrier did. He barely, I mean, had a decent couple of years the first few years he was there. I mean, he had a nine-win season his second year, yes, but the thing with Muschamp was he never got that big signature win at South Carolina. People thought that 2016 Tennessee win might be that win for him. It never really built into something bigger. And, you know, the other thing is, look, let's be honest. Well, Muschamp, the way that he sort of talked to the fans and, you know, the media, it's not like he was talking down on them, but he definitely carried the mentality like his, you know, 
mentor did, Nick Saban. Nick Saban at times, he treats the media like they're essentially CIA or FBI agents. And they're trying to figure out information on how he defends, you know, the triple option or how he defends, um, you know, spread offenses. You know, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, coaches under Nick Saban, that's how they have treated the media and treated fans. And that's sort of what Will Muschamp did while he was here. And so there was never really that personal connection for one thing, because Steve Spurrier, at least, he injected himself into the fan base some, you know, not to the level that Shane Beamer has, but more so than, you know, what Will Muschamp did. And of course, it helps when you're winning football games. So the point is, this is like the most vivacious I've ever seen South Carolina's crowd since those Spurrier years. There is a lot of hope and belief right now from this fan base with this football program. And again, this football team has not yet played a complete game all season long. And they've had moments like they did at the end of the Texas A&M game that make fans, you know, just about fall out of their seats for the wrong reasons. But the thing is, you look and you listen and watch to National Talking Heads the last couple of weeks there's a lot more mentions now about williams Bryce Stadium. Guys like Josh Pate over from Late Kick are talking about, have been talking about. Cole Kubelek from the SEC Network broadcast from this past weekend's game against the Texas A&M Aggies could not stop talking about, you know, how loud it was where he was standing, how he could barely hear Tom Hart and Jordan Rogers at times when they were trying to talk to him on the sidelines. I mean, it, it, y'all, it's coming back. It is coming back, and some people would say it is back, but I will say this. I don't think it's back all the way just yet. It's time now for South Carolina to get that signature win. That signature win that says, you know, look, this winning streak isn't a fluke. You know, yeah, some of these teams are maybe a little bit beat up. Maybe they're not performing like some of you thought they would, but you should not take that out on us because you might have been wrong about your predictions on certain teams, Okay. You shouldn't. A lot of people do that, by the way. Myself may be included. But you shouldn't do that with South Carolina because we have arrived. We are now ready to start contending in this division. If South Carolina plays a top 10 Tennessee team, beats them in November, I couldn't even begin to describe to y'all what would happen if that were to take place in williams Bryce. I think that would be one of the rare circumstances that fans would just flat out storm the field. They're very serious about fans not storming the field at williams Bryce Stadium when they have home games. But I can guarantee y'all, if that were to take place, there would be no stop in that crowd. I'm just going to put that out there. And of course, that's a long ways down the road. And that's a big statement to make about, you know, talking about the possibilities of South Carolina beating Tennessee. But my point is... This fan base, it is fully bought in. It is fully invested in what this team has done, what this coaching staff has done, and it's great for college football. If people have not been to South Carolina home games, you ought to go at least one time for the experience. And you can't talk about the surrounding areas like you may have from like 10, 15 years ago. If that's what your thought is about the area surrounding the stadium, you you don't understand what they have done, the renovations that have been made, how great a lot of these areas look now and the possibilities for maybe there to be some additions in the future. And of course, we'll see how all of that plays out. But that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show. As always, what are your thoughts on this environment that williams Bryce Stadium has brought back in the 2022 football season? An environment that's reminiscent of the environment that was here during the glory years under Steve Spurrier. And what are your thoughts on the men's basketball team heading into the season? Is there someone that maybe is a returner from last year's roster that you're looking to see potentially break out? What do you think the fair expectations would be for Gigi Jackson this next season? I want to hear all of y'all's thoughts on that and more down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube. And of course, if you're listening to today's show on an audio podcast app, Wherever you get your podcast daily, you can also shoot me a message on Twitter at a line underscore SC. I'll be sure to respond to any replies or comments that you have for me as quickly as I see them. And once again, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen today. Now, for your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, where the biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day all take place. Available on the Odyssey app. 
YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. But once again, that does it for today's show. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday and a fantastic weekend. And if you're going to the game, as I mentioned yesterday, please be safe. I will catch you all on the next show on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Thank you.